This morning, my sermon title is Let us go after the heart of God. Can we say it together? Let us go after the heart of God. And the scripture is taken, first of all, from Sam, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 to 14. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which He commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for Himself a man after His own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over His people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And then we look at the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 22. And when God had removed Saul, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask for your Holy Spirit to anoint your servant and to touch the hearts and the ears of your people that together we may know you more. Together we may indeed go after your heart. And so we commit this time of the preaching of your word into your mighty hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. These two passages tell us about King Saul being removed from his kingship. Why? Because he did not obey the commandment of God. He was disobedient to the will of God. And God had to remove him from his kingship. And then God began to seek for another man, another person. And the quality, what was God looking for? He said, he was looking for a man who is after God's own heart. And he found a man in David. And David became the next king. Now, the, here he says that God had to seek. God sought for a man. God had to go after. God had to find. God had to seek. That means that it is not easy to find such a man. Not easy to find a person who is after the heart of God. But thank God, the person was found and David became the next king. Now, it wasn't just about being promoted to be a king. It wasn't just about the power or the prosperity. But it was really for David to lead the people of God. Well, as a king, it's also to lead them into all the path of life, to lead them to know God more and to teach them, to inspire them, to also have a heart after God. You see, today God is still looking for a person, whether a man or a woman, whether a boy or a girl. God is still looking for a person or to have a heart that's after the heart of God. Actually, Every child of the Heavenly Father. Are you a child of the Heavenly Father? Yes. Every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of us here, should be a person after God's own heart. All of us are to be a person after God's own heart. Now, sometimes we look at this, this statement, after God's own heart. And I think many Christians thought that it is such a super high standard, isn't it? It's like, ah, a man after God's own heart. Oh, only a superhero like David. Oh, David, yes, yes. He's a man after God's own heart. Me? Oh, so, so, so far away. And, and, and so when we think that it doesn't apply to us, then what did we do? We put the verse aside. We ignore it. We, we don't think about it. And actually, for a long time, this was the way I, I look at it. I thought, oh, I don't match up. I, I, I'm not. Oh, I, I, I'm nowhere near the standard. And, and so I put it aside until the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Thank God the Holy Spirit did not give up on us. Thank God the Holy Spirit speak to us and teach us. And this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. This is what He said. He said, if 
you are not after God's heart, then whose heart are you after? If you're not after God's heart, then you're after whose heart then? You see, what does it mean to be after God's heart? It has a dual meaning. Dual meaning, firstly, it means to pursue, to go after the heart of God. That's what it means to be after God's heart. Secondly, it also means after as in accordingly. And so it means to live according to the heart of God. And so when it says that David has a heart after God's heart, it means that he pursues after God. It means that he lived his life according to the heart of God. He lived according to the will of God. He lived according to the standard of God. Now, what about us? If we are not after God's heart, if we are not pursuing after God, if we are not living after God's heart, then who are we pursuing then? Whose heart are we going after? We are living according to whose heart then? Think about it. In your life, whose heart are you after? How are you living? According to whose standard then? Maybe you are still living according to the expectation of parents. Right? From young, your parents have high expectations. And even when you are old, subconsciously, you still are, are, are remembering, you are still under the influence. Oh, you are still trying to live up to the expectation of your parents? Or maybe you are living according to your girlfriend or your boyfriend's standard. Maybe you are still trying to please your your girlfriend or your boyfriend. You are still living after the heart of your friend. What about peer pressure? Maybe you are still wanting to be like your friends. How your friend lives how they behave. You're still influenced by that. You're still wanting to be just like them. And so your hairstyle, maybe the thing you do, you're wanting to be just like them. You're after their heart. Or maybe it is work pressure, what your boss wants. So you're still trying to live according to your boss' heart. Or maybe societal norms. And that refers to what the society as a whole, what other people are doing. Are you living according to what this world is going on? The worldly thinking and values, are you still trying to follow them? That means you are going after their heart. And of course, not just others. What about me? I, me and myself, pride, self-centeredness. Are you living according to your own heart? Are you after your own desire? And with all this, may I ask you a question? Are you tired? Are you tired? And many say, oh, I'm tired. Well, now, what I'm talking about is this. When you're trying to please others, when you're trying to go after the heart of others, when you're trying to live according to other people's standards, do you know that you'll be very tired? Yes, you'll be so tired. It's very tiring to live according to other people's standard. To please other people. Worse still, if you're trying to please yourself, I tell you, it's even worse. Worse because you will be disappointed. You will be unfulfilled. You will feel so empty in your life. Come to Jesus then, if you're tired. Because Jesus said, in Matthew 11, He said, all you who who labor and are heavy laden, come to me, Jesus invite us. Because He gives us Rest. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, He is gentle and lowly in heart. When we come to Him, we will find rest. Jesus said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That means when we come to Jesus, does Jesus have standard? Definitely. His standard is high. Does Jesus have requirement? Of course. But I want you to know that His standard, His requirement, oh, they are not impossible. He described it as easy and light. How is that so? Well, let me share with you. Life truly can be simpler and easier. You see, when you come to Jesus, you discover that it is so much easier to please God than to please people. You agree? Some people thought that, wow, please God. Wow, God so holy. But actually, you think of it. 
when you try to please people, I tell you, it's a headache, it's a heartache, isn't it? Why? What is it so hard to please people? Many reasons. Well, because people are unreasonable. Because <laughs> people have all kinds of unreasonable demons. Because people keep changing. Today they want like that, tomorrow they want another way. And, and people are selfish, right? And so if you want to please people, you'll be so, you know, so, so hard. Eh? You can't please people. On the other hand, our God is so different, amen? Our God is so loving. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you sacrificially. He never changes, Amen. Oh, and, and he, when He demands something of you, He actually helps you with it. He actually gives you the power. He actually oh, empowers you so that you can do it. That's why Jesus came and died for us. If He only asks us to be holy, none of us can match up to it. But He not only said, be ye holy, He actually came, died for us, gives us the Holy Spirit to empower us, to guide us, to change us, so that we can live a holy life. Not in our own strength, but in God's strength. Amen? So Jesus came personally to help us. That's why, ultimately, to be a person after God's own heart is really by the grace of God. It's really by the grace of God. That means we can't do it on our own, but by His grace. He gives us grace so that we can live such a life, so that we can live according to God's heart, so that all of us can say, and we should say that, God, I want to be, and I am a person after your heart. Because if I'm, I'm not after God's heart, then I'll be after other people's heart. Then I'll be after my own heart, and I'll be in big trouble. But today, your words show me, Lord, by your grace, I can be a person after your heart. By grace. It's unmerited favor. In other words, we don't deserve His love. We can't do it. But Jesus loves us anyway. He loves us unconditionally. He loves you sacrificially. So that when we come before Him, although we are so bad, you agree? <laughs> Some of, some of us better, no? <laughs> All of us, we are so bad. But when we come before Christ, He loves us. He forgives us. He accepts us. Oh, what a love. And He draws us to His heart. Amen? So this is by the grace of God that we can become a person that is well-pleasing to God. We can become a person that is accepted by God. Oh, we can become a person that God says, Yes, this is my child. Yes, this is a person after my, God, my own heart. How can it be? By the grace of God. That's what salvation is all about. That's what transformation is all about. By God's grace. But at the same time, how do we respond to this grace then? And I challenge us to understand and to put into practice that we don't take the grace of God for granted. Instead, we respond with passion for God. Hallelujah. Passion for God means we go after the heart of God. We seek to know Jesus more. We love Him more. We serve Him more. We go after Him. We pursue Him with a passion. You see, that's why some people misunderstood grace. You see, they thought, oh, all is by grace and everything is done by God. Then I don't do anything. Well, as far as salvation is concerned, we can't do anything. But you see, grace opened the door. After we enter the door, then what do we do? You see, in the Old Testament, oh, the, the tabernacle, you, you enter the door. There was the outer court. Do you stay at the outer court? Some people say, oh, thank God, by grace, I'm in, I'm in. So they just hang around there. They don't want to pursue further. Oh, they are complacent. They are just satisfied there. Okay, enough. I don't want to be too, too spiritual. Enough, I just want to stay here. But there are some who are pressing more. They will go further. They respond to the grace of God with passion. They say, God, I want to know you more. I'm not going to stay at the outer court. I want to go into the holy place. And then they went in, went to the holy place. And, and then, oh, they don't stay at the holy place. They say they're still the holy of holies. Where the Shekinah glory of the Lord is. Now, in the Old Testament, 
People couldn't just go in. Only the high priest can go in once a year. But Jesus has opened a new and living way. And so spiritually, all of us can go right in. But the question is still this. Do you stay oh, at the entrance or do you press right in? You see, pressing right in is not talking about, oh, by our own works or anything like that. You see, grace is applied to all. All of us are given the same entrance point. But what do you do after that? You see, Jesus had 12 disciples. Three of them, Peter, James and John, they were closer to Jesus. You know that? That's why in many important events, they were the ones who were with Jesus. But among the three, one of them was the closest to Jesus. Who was that? John. John was the one who, who lay at the bosom of Jesus. Oh, John was the one, in fact, at the cross. John was the only one who remained there. Peter, with all his boasting, he chickened out, ran away. What was there? Like some closer, some closest? Did Jesus play favoritism? Not at all. It's simply this. Grace was given to all of us. We have the same entry point. All can come. All can come. But what do you do after that? Do you just stay there and say, okay, like that, enough? Or will you press hard and say, God, I want to know you more? John press in after the heart of God. And look around here in this century. All of us, we have entered into salvation. All of us, we love God, but some are closer to God. And a few are closest to God. And once again, what was that the difference? Not because of favoritism, simply this. We can be as close to Jesus as much as you wanted. If you are not close to Jesus, not because Jesus moved. He didn't move. It is we who move. Or rather, we didn't press in. We just stay far away and say, hello, and that's it. But for some, for a few maybe, they went right in. They press in. God, I want to know you more. I want to worship you and, and, and encounter you. I want to experience your Shekinah glory. Lord, I want to hear from you. And when we have such a heart, God comes to us, reveal himself to us, and the relationship get closer, get stronger. And so I pray that all of us here, all of us here, not just a few, not just some of us, but all of us will press in and say, God, I want to know you more. God, I want to go after your heart. I want to pursue after the heart of God. I want to live according to the heart of God. Now, it is not something that we attain. It's not like, okay, I arrived. I passed PSLE already. Oh, I passed O-level already. Oh, oh, okay, I passed the exam already. I got it! No, it's a process. It's a journey. It's, in fact, it's a lifelong journey. You realize that? It's not something that you can say, oh, I'm, I'm there, I'm so close to Jesus already. You see, relationship is dynamic. Relationship is alive. Relationship, if, if it's not carried on, it will die off. And same way with our relationship with God. It's not just about maintenance. We're not talking about maintenance of the relationship. I'm talking about oh, pursuing, pressing in, getting oh, to know Him even more, love Him more, so that the relationship deepens, so that the relationship strengthens, so that the relationship is so strong. Hallelujah. And so it's a lifelong journey. It's a process. It's a pursuit. It's a pursuit of going after the heart of God. And so, brothers and sisters, oh, please don't think that it's only David. No, it's not just David, but it's all of us. All of us. Let us be a people after God's own heart. Let us be a church after God's own heart. Anybody say amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Not because you have to say, but deep from within our heart, let it be our desire, amen. Let that desire arise and say, God, I'm not going to be contented, complacent, satisfied with where I am in my relationship with you. Oh, I, I've known Jesus so many years, and, and, but I want to keep growing. 
You see, it's a bad sign when Christians say, Wow, last time, you know, last time so committed. Oh, last time so spiritual. Oh, last time so... When we start talking like that, something has gone terribly wrong. You see, if if we have more history than future, then we are finished. No. Thank God for the past. Thank God for the encounters in the past. Thank God in the past you love Jesus so much. But what about now? What about tomorrow? Oh, let it be our pursuit, amen? Let it be our desire and say, God, I want to know you more than yesterday. I want to love you more than yesterday. I want to serve you more than yesterday. Hallelujah. And day by day, oh, don't worry, you will never know God so well that, oh, nothing to know already. God is so awesome, so great, so infinite. Oh, in all of eternity. Some people wonder, how are eternity so long, you know? Wow, wait, go up there and then after a while get sien. No, 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 you don't worry. You see, you know what is infinite? You see, God is infinitely wise. God is infinitely beautiful. God is infinitely, oh, marvelous. And what it means is that in all of eternity, you will still discover all the beauty about God. In all of eternity, you will still discover God is so amazing, so wonderful. Hallelujah. And so it takes all of our lifetime, not just on earth, but all of eternity for us to go after God. And it's not something like as if you're never rich and and you're trying so hard. No, by the grace of God, He brings you in. He brings you into a relationship. He brings you into His family. Oh, He brings you in. But let us respond with passion. Amen. Passion. And say, God, I'm not going to just stay right here. Amen. God, I want more. I want more of you. God, I want to experience more of you. God, I want to oh, experience more of your power, more of your love, more of your wisdom, more of everything about God, anything to do with God. Lord, I want you. Wow, when we have such a passion, when we have such a heart, you know what? you discover that your relationship with God will not stand in, will not go back, but it will keep growing. Hallelujah. And your life will never, never be the same. Amen. Praise God. And so today, I also want to talk about David a little bit because David was a man who was described as the man after God's own heart. So even as we say, God, I want to be such a person, we can learn from David. And you realize that David wasn't the only one. Okay, please don't think that in the whole Bible, only David is after God's own heart. Actually, all the heroes of faith, all the men and women of God, they had a heart after God as well. But this description was specially applied to David. And David became an example. David became an inspiration to all of us. And truly in the Bible, no other human character was mentioned more than David. As you look at the Bible character, more was said about David than anyone else. And his life wasn't perfect, obviously, but he has such a passion for God that God used him to encourage us. God used him to inspire us. And there's so much about his story that, you know, preacher and Sunday school children alike all like him. There's so much to talk about. And so I zero in on three areas in his life that we can learn, that we can apply, that will help us, propel us in this journey of becoming a person after God's own heart. What are these three qualities? Number one, number one, serve faithfully as a worker. Serve faithfully as a worker. Now, the word worker is not very inspiring, right? It's a hard worker. But it describes our life in terms of the things we do, whether it's full-time work or as a full-time student or, or whether it's just voluntary work. But the point is that in the things that we do, in the things that we work, let us serve faithfully. What does it have to do with after God's own heart? Everything. You see, after God's heart doesn't mean like only the big thing, the spectacular, the mighty things that we do. Actually, it starts with the small daily mundane things that we serve 
faithfully. It is in those things that God is well pleased. It is in those things that, oh, God fashioned our heart to be after Him. And that's what we learn from David. You see, David started off, you know, when he appeared in the story, he was a teenager, probably 15, 16 years old, and he was a young shepherd boy. Now, shepherding was a normal, menial job in Israel. It's not, it's not the most exciting job that people will clamor after. But David had a job to do. He had to look after the sheep of his father. So it was his father's sheep. But he did his job faithfully. You see, that was something different about this young man. You see, others, they could have done the job, but then they just do it out of duty. They just perform. But David was different. How different? Well, let's look at what was described of him in 1 Samuel chapter 17 when he was talking to King Saul in verse 34 to 35. David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Notice once again, it wasn't his sheep. In other words, oh, this is not my business. This is not my company, you know. But then, hey, he didn't see it that way. He was faithful as a worker. How faithful? When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, what would you have done? For David? <laughs> if, if we were there, wow, thank God the lion ran gone already. Thank God the bear has gone away. Thank God for saving my life. I think most of us will be like that. But not for David. You know what did David do? Verse 35 say, he went after it. David, are you out of your mind? Right? I mean, the lion, the, the bear, they, 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 they eat the sheep and, and they, they went. I mean, let them go. Let them go. Why, why would you want to go after them? But for David, he was thinking of rescuing the sheep. He see the sheep as more important than his own safety. That was faithfulness. More so, especially when it's not even his sheep. It was his father's sheep. And his father didn't really treat him that fantastic, you know. When Samuel came to anoint one of his sons to be the next king, the father forgot about David. That tells you something about their relationship. In fact, some Bible scholar, guessing, just guessing, I mean nobody knows, guessing that maybe David wasn't, uh, uh, born of a legitimate uh, birth and so forth and, and we, we don't know we only know one thing the father Jesse only remember oh these seven sons David forgot about him until Samuel said no not this not this seven is that do you have another son are you sure you didn't miss out anybody and they say oh yeah 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 there's one out there looking after the sheep and yet David he was so faithful in his work. He was so faithful in the little things. He went after the, the ferocious animal. He struck it, rescued the sheep from his mouth. And when it turned on me, he said, I seized it by his hair, struck it and killed it. Wow, such heroism. And, and thank God that he was heroic. But the whole process, there was the help of God. There was the hand of God. Amen. You see, when you are willing to serve God, God will give you the power. That is grace. That is the help of God. It, we don't depend on our own strength because our own strength is insufficient. But then the key is still is this. If you are not willing to serve, if you are not willing to be faithful, if you run away, then don't expect God to give you that kind of power. It's when you step out and say, God, I will not let the lion and the bear take away my, my sheep. I will rescue my sheep. He went after the sheep. He had the heart of a shepherd. And the heart of a shepherd is the heart of our God. You see, so from young, he was after the heart of God already. And as what Jesus taught us in the New Testament, if you are faithful in the small thing, then you will be faithful in the big thing. David was faithful with the sheep. That's why God can entrust to him the whole nation. The whole nation was entrusted to David. Why? Because he was faithful. 
You see, he was faithful in the small thing. He was faithful in the work at hand. No, a lot of time we, 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 we talk about, yes, you know, God, what are you calling me to do? Well, it takes a while. You see, as God fashioned you, you see, as God lead you through experiences, God begin to reveal to you what is your lifetime calling. And thank God when you know your lifetime calling, you can run with it. But don't wait until you know. Right now, you start with things that you can do right now. That's why last time I encouraged new Christians to, to get involved in ushering. You know what I said to them? I said, hey, it doesn't take a special gift, you know. You can serve. So long as you have a servant heart, you can serve. And it's a good stepping form. You don't have to wait until, God, what is my lifetime calling, you know? What are you calling me to? You don't have to wait for that right now. Meanwhile, start serving. Meanwhile, be faithful. Be faithful to the small thing. From maybe start with ushering or maybe, you know, one other, other ministry, the worship team shouting, no, 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 don't go ushering, come to worship team. Right? <laughs> okay, well, they are very united. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but the point is that, that we start where we are in things that we can do. You see, if we are not faithful in the things that we can do right now, how can God entrust you with the lifetime calling? Even when you know it, you can't do it because you have not been fashioned. You have not been trained. David was trained when he was shepherding. He was trained to fight because he was protecting his sheep. That's why one day he could step up and fight Goliath the giant. It didn't happen overnight. There was a process. And this is what we've got to learn. Being a man after God's own heart. It means that day by day in the routine, in the mundane, we start there. We start serving. We start doing things that we can do. Look around. What are some things that I can do? Well, what are the most important gifts in the body of Christ? People like to ask that question. People like to discuss that question. What is the most important gift? My answer is this. The gift that meet the most urgent need right now. The gift that meet the most necessary need right now. The, the gift that can meet the need of the body right now. That is the most important gift. You see, if the, the body need, need teaching right now, then, well, that is the most important gift. Well, if the body need, need the, the, the gift of, of, of comfort or the gift of mercy, well, then that is the most important gift right now. You see, all gifts are needed. And all of us can play a part. But we don't wait until, oh, we know what is my lifetime calling. Then we start doing something. But even where we are right now, we start serving. Oh, we start meeting needs. Oh, when I see a need, I can do something. I may not be the most gifted person, but when I'm willing to do it, you know what? God can give you the gift. God can give you the gift. God can empower you. And wow, you, you, you can meet a need in the body and you begin to grow. You begin to expand. You begin to be trained. And then as you go along, oh, you begin to realize, hey, God, you have a lifetime calling for my life and, and, and I'll run with it. Hallelujah. But God can entrust it to you because in the faithfulness of the little things, you have proven yourself. You have grown. You have learned. You have been trained. Amen. And that was David. He was faithful in looking after the sheep. And he was also very humble in his faithfulness as well. If you recall, just how I mentioned that Samuel came to, came to anoint uh, Jesse's son to be the next king, right? And wow, you know, by the revelation of God, Jesse, you know, you know where's your, you know, one more son, and, and David came. And he was the man. So Samuel anointed him. What a, what an amazing day, isn't it? From a shepherd boy, he was going to be the king. Wow, lifetime calling. But before that came to pass, do you know that after Samuel left, the next day after the anointing, the next morning, when everybody woke up, when David woke up, what did he do? He went back to shepherding. You see, there's a lesson we must learn. Faithfulness, humility, in the small thing. David didn't wake up and say, ha, 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 I'm the next king. You know, telling his brother, all of you, you know, you go and do my work now. He didn't. 
he was still, you know, humble. Huh? He wasn't on cloud line. His feet were still on the ground. He just went back to shepherding. And he faithfully did it. So much so that later on, when there was a war, the father sent David. Say, David, your brothers are in the front line. Oh, I, I don't have WhatsApp. I don't have video call. I don't know how are they. Huh. I want to know how are they. So David, get some food. Bring it to the front line. You know, see how your brothers are and then come back and report to me. And David, before he left, he arranged for someone to look after the sheep. Yeah. He, he didn't just say, oh, okay, let's go and go. And then forget. Some people say, oh, okay, go. And then and forget about their responsibility. He took care of his responsibility before going. He was faithful. He was humble. He had the heart of God. In fact, in Philippians 2.5, in Philippians 2.5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. This is to all of us. Now, what is the attitude of Jesus? We can summarize it in this way. The attitude of Jesus, first of all, He humbled Himself. That's what Philippians 2 talks about. He humbled Himself. He obeyed the Father. Did He? Of course. And He sacrificed for others. What was the attitude of Jesus? He humbled himself, he obeyed the Father, and he sacrificed for others. Now, when you look at David, this is what he did. He humbled himself. He obeyed his earthly father, and he sacrificed for others. He sacrificed for the sheep. And when he fought Goliath, he was sacrificing, risking his life for the whole nation. He had the same attitude. He had the same mind. He was after the heart of God. And so, let us learn this lesson and you discover. That's how you grow into the likeness of Christ. That's how you, you, you grow in your, in, in your heart capacity that God can entrust you with more. Amen? So, what was the first thing? Serve faithfully as a worker. Number two, fight courageously as a warrior. Fight courageously as a warrior. David was a warrior. What is that to do with us? Everything. Do you know that we are all warriors in life? Yeah? And it's, yes, it's a figurative uh, description. But in truth, life is a battle and we have enemy. And the enemy is not the person next to you. Your, the enemy is who? The devil, right? The devil is our enemy. We are in a spiritual warfare. We are in the, in the battle. And we are warriors. And we need to fight courageously as a warrior. Otherwise, the devil will have the upper hand over you. For David, his best known battle was, of course, when he fought Goliath the giant. He was a young man. He wasn't a soldier. He didn't even have his armor or his weapon. But when he saw Goliath taunting the nation, he stepped up in courage. He stepped up in faith. And Goliath was a giant. He was a seasoned warrior. He, he, he was so tall. He was so big. But David, he didn't fight in his own strength. He fight courageously, first of all, for God's glory, and secondly, he fought in God's power. That was the secret to his victory. He fought for God's glory and he fought in God's power. We, we read that in 1 Samuel 17. In verse 26, he said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, the word un uncircumcised. He says circumcision is a symbol of the covenant between God and Israel. So a circumcised one is a believer. It's a Jewish, it's a believer. It's a symbol. So one who is uncircumcised is a non-Jew. And it's not just about the race, but it's about the faith. It's a person who is not in covenant relationship with God. And so what David was saying is this, who is this unbeliever? There to defy the armies of the living God. So he was fighting for God's glory. 
And then in verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and machine gun. No, no machine gun. And javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And so David, he's saying that, Hey, you come with all your weapons, but I come against you in the name of my God. He fought in God's power. The name of God is mighty power. The name of God is above all other power. In the name of Jesus, Amen. In the name of Jesus, we have victory over the enemy. Devil run. Devil has to run in the name of Jesus. And so, brothers and sisters, we are all in the spiritual warfare. And so being a person after God's own heart, it's not about you know, just you know, sitting on the, on the, on the buffalo. No, that is, that is Chinese type. Okay. Uh, Western type, sitting on the horse. For Israel type, did David sit on the ship? No, he didn't. Okay. But he was playing the harp, worshipping God. Yes, I mean he did that. But what I'm trying to say is this. Being a person after God's own heart, it's not just on the, the nice thing, the, oh, the worshipping and the loving only. But it's also on the fighting, on the warring. Because why? We do have an enemy. And so we fight courageously for God's glory in God's power. Amen. Because if you don't fight, you may, you may die spiritually, physically. It's just like in a, at, during wartime. The enemy don't care whether you're civilians or not. Of course, there's international law of uh, what, uh, what human rights or whatever. But oftentimes, during wartime, the civilian casualty is high. The civilian are the ones who suffer the most. And, and oftentimes, when the soldiers come in, they did all kinds of atrocity. Spiritually, it's the same. You can't say that, oh, I'm, I, I, I'm a not so committed Christian, so devil, go after the committed one. You know, Don't come after me. No, the devil, don't, don't think like that. The devil say, wow, you, know, you are the weakest, easier, eat you first. Isn't it? And so, at war, none is spared. The best defense is still offense. The best defense is still in the name of Jesus, fight the enemy. Otherwise, you may die, you may fall. And David's life reminded us of that. You see, David's biggest battle is actually not Goliath. His biggest battle actually is not with Absalom, his son. His biggest battle is not with King Saul who persecuted him. His biggest battle is actually with himself. Struggling with temptation. Struggling with lust. Lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh. You know the story? How he fell into adultery with Bathsheba. It's a story about the life of David that we wish is not there. We wish is covered up. But you see, the Bible is truly the Word of God. God doesn't cover. God allow it to be exposed as a warning to all of us. He fought Goliath, he won. He fought King Saul, he persevered. In the end, he had a victory. Even with his son's rebellion, well, God turned it around. But when it comes to temptation, when it comes to sin, Sadly, David fell. In the end, God granted mercy to him when he repented. But at the cost, his family suffered. The nation suffered as a result. And so, the New Testament warning is really in place. No matter how familiar you may be with 1 Peter 5, 8-9. But let us take heed to that. In 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9 says, Be self control and alert. Your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. He wants to devour you. And when he devours you, he won't even, even spit out the, the bones. Okay. That means he swallow you all in. But verse 9 says, Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And so this is a call 
to all of us. Together, resist the devil. Yes, there may be suffering. Yes, there may be hardship. But you are not the only one. You are not alone. There are many, in fact, going through worse things right now. In truth, in many nations, under oppression or under persecution, even martyrdom. But together, we stand firm in faith and fight courageously for God's glory as a warrior. Amen. And the victory is indeed ours. James 4, 7 promises us, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the key is this, two, four. One, you must submit to God. If you're not in submission to God, there's no covering. If you're not in submission to God, the devil can come into your life. Submit to God. Then you can resist the devil. And in the name of Jesus, the devil has to flee. You have the victory. You can fight courageously and you will conquer victoriously. Hallelujah. And so, how to be a person after God's own heart? It starts with the small thing. It starts with the daily things. It starts with being faithful in serving. It continues in being courageous in fighting the enemy, the devil. And thirdly, a third lesson we must learn is to worship passionately as a worshipper. Worship passionately as a worshipper. I emphasized passion earlier on. And once again, may we be stirred up in our passion for God. Right now it's World Cup season. You see the football fans, are they passionate? They are, you know. See the way they worship? Oh no, they didn't. But see the way they sing and dance and cheer for their hero. Jesus is our hero. Amen. Wow. Worship God passionately. Amen. And when we talk about worship, I'm not just talking about singing in church. Singing is one form of expression. But worship is more than the singing and the music. Worship is our entire life in all things that we do. And David, from young, he had a heart of worship unto God. That's how God can lead him. God can train him because his heart is towards God. You see, from young, he worshipped God passionately with his songs. He, he, he was musical. Thank God he could write songs. Thank God he could play the guitar. Oh no, sorry, not guitar. He could play the harp, alright? But seriously, all of us here, we may not be musical, but we can make a joyful noise unto God. Amen? And when David worshipped God, I want to know, it flows out of the heart of love for, for his God. You see, that's the most important. It's from the heart. Then, what comes from the mouth is beautiful and meaningful. In Psalms 42 verse 1, in Psalms 42 verse 1, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. He described, he poured out his heart to God. His heart truly yearned for God. Like the deer that was so thirsty. Why? Being chased after by the ferocious animal. And the deer ran and ran and under the sun. Oh, the deer was panting, the deer was thirsty. The deer lived living water. And David said, this is how I feel about my God. My soul is so thirsty for Him. Out of a heart of love. That's why the song that came was so beautiful. Because it was sung from a heart of love. And in Psalms 27 verse 4, One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord for all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. Once again, out of a heart of love, there is such a longing for the presence of God. You see, he was a king and he didn't write this superficially. He meant it from his heart. He was a king. He lived in the palace and his palace was beautiful. But he said, I'd rather be in the house of the Lord. And at that point, the temple wasn't even built yet. Remember that. At that time, when he talked about the house of the Lord, it was a tent. It was a tabernacle. 
It was a simple structure, but it was the presence of God. You see? It was the presence of God. And he said, I want to be in the house of the Lord. I will dwell there all my life. He'd rather be in the house of God than to be in his beautiful palace. He has such a longing for the presence of God. That is worshipping passionately. And I challenge all of us. You see, once again, it's not about church attendance. If you see it just as an attendance, then you have missed the whole thing. You see, we worship individually at home in our devotion, but we worship together as a church, as a family. We worship corporately. Amen. We come to the house of God. We encounter God together. We encounter His presence together. We love Him together. And when we can come, you know what? It's wonderful. Amen. It's beautiful. Well, if you haven't discovered that, well, open your heart to Him. Amen. Let the church service be a powerful encounter with the Lord. And so David worshipped God passionately out of his love, out of his longing for God. And I want you to know that out of that love and the longing, do you know that he expressed it huh, unreservedly? He expressed it passionately. Remember the story in 2 Samuel chapter 6? When he brought back the ark to Jerusalem. We, we shared this before, but let me just mention it again. When he brought the ark back to Jerusalem, what did he do? He led the way in worship. He, was, he took off his kingly robe. And he put on the, the ephod. What, what the priest put on, where on the outside. And... And he was leaping, he was dancing, he was singing before the Lord. And so the procession, the whole city was there. So King David led the procession, bring the ark into the city. And the whole nation, the whole city, everybody could see the king right in front, leading the rest in worship, in singing, in dancing before God. And if it's just this sin, we, it may not catch our attention that much. But it was his wife, in her bad example, that, that really sealed, sealed the deal in that sense. You see, she was at the window. She looked down. Oh my, you know, my husband, you know, made me lose face. Oh, she is a king. How can he dance like that? He's a king. He should be very dignified. He should stand there and, and let his subject do all these things and... And she despised him in, in her heart. And the Bible goes on to say that she was barren throughout her life. She couldn't give birth. And it's more than just people see it as a punishment on her physically, but it's more than that. It was that by her attitude, she cut herself off from the opportunity to be the mother of the Messiah. Remember, Jesus, the Messiah, was from the line of David. And for Mitchell, her name, the wife of David, for Mitchell to be barren, that means she had no chance. She had no chance to be in the ancestry, to be in the line of the Messiah. What a loss! Because her attitude. She had no heart after God. She had a heart for image. She had a heart for dignity. She had a heart for, for, for the royalty. But David had a heart for God. While David worshipped, Mitchell was watching. And please don't do that. Sometimes people, oh no, people are worshipping, they just watch around. Watch around. Oh, this one, oh, that one. No, no, don't do that. When we worship, let's focus on God. Amen. All of us. And I encourage all of us, worship God passionately, with expression. Amen. Yes, we may be getting old. But then, it's a sacrifice of praise. Amen. The Bible teaches us when we worship, what do we do? We sing. Right? Open our mouth and sing. We clap. Amen. We raise our hand. Sometimes we dance. <laughs> Sometimes we jump. Okay? Sometimes we kneel. Sometimes we, we prostrate. But the point is that it's never passive. It's never indifferent. It's never just standing aside as a spectator. 
No, worship is full participation. So, if you think that, yeah, but I don't have the heart. Well, whether you have the heart or, or not, just do it. Do it until you got a heart. <laughs> Seriously, you know, you may not have the heart to go to work, but you still go anyway. You may not have the heart to go to school, but you still got to go. Well, so this is making a choice. This is not hypocrisy. Some people say, I don't want to be hypocrite. I have no mood, so I don't sing. I don't raise hand. Well, this is not hypocrisy. This, this is simply, are you going to take control over your flesh? Are you going to do the right thing? Do the right thing. Amen? Worship passionately. And so church, learn to worship God with expression, like what David did. When you are excited about God, you cannot just stand there. Amen? And so, what to do? Well, start with raising your hand. Well, your hand very tired. Well, you can put down for a while. And I'm not talking about just the outward, brothers and sisters. But you've got to learn to express it. Many a times, it's when you do it, then the emotion follow. If you wait until you've got emotion, got the feelings, <laughs> well, you, <laughs> the feelings may never come and you will never do it. But when you come to before the presence of God, get excited about God, get passionate about God. So learn, learn to clap, amen, hallelujah, and learn to raise your hand. Do it, you know, don't care what people think, huh? Just do it. And then when you do it unto Jesus, after a while, you know, your heart catch up with your expression. Your heart catch up, amen, and enter into the presence of God. Hallelujah. So David worshipped his God so passionately. What a lesson. What an inspiration for all of us. Amen. And so why was David a man after God's own heart? We can talk about his obedience. We can talk about his, his doing the commandment of God. We can talk about many things. But as we focus on these three areas, and all these three areas apply to our life, start with the small thing. Serve faithfully. Consistently, amen. Fight as a warrior for Christ. And worship God all our life. And David's life was concluded with this verse in Acts 13 verse 36. Acts 13 verse 36 says, but when, For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. That means he passed away. But what a conclusion, isn't it? All his, he was described as a man who served God's purpose in his own generation. How about us? His generation is past. Our generation is still here. May we serve God's purpose in our generation as well. God is still seeking for a person after his own heart. He found one in David. Can he find one right here? I pray, not just one, but many. In fact, all of us, amen, all of us be a person after God's own heart. It's an imperfect journey, full of weaknesses, full of our human frailty, but it's a journey, it's a pursuit that God is calling and drawing us. Let us be a people. Let us be a church who is after the heart of God. And let us come back to God in repentance and revival. Let us live for Jesus and go after His heart. Amen. Shall we stand? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's respond to the invitation of God. He's inviting us. He's calling us. Come, draw near to Him. Be a man after His heart. Worship Him with passion. Amen. Come before Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know when we raise our hand, it's a sign of worship, it's a sign of surrender, but it's also a sign of faith because we are standing it to God to receive from Him. Amen. Today, all of us need His grace. All of us need His power to live this life, to walk this way. 
but with His grace, with His empowerment, thank God, we are not alone. Amen. Thank God, we can walk victoriously. And so I invite us to raise our hand to Jesus as we pray. Lord Jesus, You are my Savior. You are my Lord. You are my Master. Lord Jesus, I know my heart is so prone to wonder. How many times has my heart got distracted, turned around, wander off? But again and again, you called me back. Oh, your Holy Spirit, gently leading me, guiding me back to you. I hear the voice of my Savior. I hear the voice of my Shepherd calling me, calling me. And I respond to you, O God. Lord, seal this heart, O God. Seal it with your cords of love. Let my heart not wander, not go off again. Lord, strengthen me with your grace. When I'm weak, make me strong. When I'm distracted, oh God, turn my focus back to you, O God. Lord, we want you more than anyone, more than anything else. Cultivate in us, O God, Lord, I pray, a heart that goes after you, a heart that pursues you so passionately, O God, with love, with longing, O God. Let my heart, O God, seek to please you. And it's so wonderful to please you more than to please anyone else, more than to please myself. Lord, let me please you. Let me seek you. Let me fulfill your will, O God. Lord Jesus, let me live according to your heart. Show me your heart. Give me your heart. Lord, make me a person after your own heart, O God. Make us, O God, as a people, make us as a church, O God, to have a heart that's after your own heart. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. Lord, let it not be the prayer for just this moment, but let it be the prayer of our life. Let it be a lifelong pursuit, O God, that Jesus you will always be the one and only one in our life. I bless my brothers and my sisters right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for your work in their life. Lord Jesus, thank you for their great love for you, O God. Thank you for their great commitment towards you. And I bless them right now, O God. Lord, pour out your love upon them. Lord, as I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, pour out my love to them as well, O God. Lord, to let them know how much I appreciate them, I love them, and pray for them. And so, Lord, bind us together in one accord of love. And Lord, let all of us prosper in our pursuit of you, O God. And truly, our whole life is a life of blessing because of you. We thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, as we close the service, Lord, as we prepare, Lord, for CG, for fellowship, Lord, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit all take full control in our heart, in our life, for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.